Let's get started with Kamunda Cloud and the ZB Node client. I am your host, Josh Wolf, and I'm going to walk you through creating a new cluster, a basic kind of uh, ZB Node project. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to install the tools that we need. You're going to have to have Node.js installed and configured on your machine. That's a prerequisite. So the tools that we're going to need, npm i minus g, we're going to use pnpm, and we're going to need TypeScript. And we're going to need TS node. So I'm going to install these three packages like this. So npm i minus g. Let's make that nice and big for you. There we go. Good. Okay. Let's get those things installed. So the minus g flag for npm i is for install. Minus g means globally. It means that we can use them from the command line from anywhere in the, the file system. So inside our new project, we can do it in there. Let's have a look. What does that say? Uh, already exists, pnpmx, uh, okay, overwrite f files recklessly, we're going to try that. Do I recommend trying this at home with double minus force? You probably won't come across this, but hey, if you do, um, I sure hope you know what you are doing. <laughs> okay, there we go, great. As you can see, I'm using node version 1210. Okay, we've done that. Now we're going to make a directory for this new project and we're going to call it uh, come into cloud starter node. There you go. CD into this come into cloud starter node. Come under cloud starter node. Like that. Nothing in there. It's empty. Good. Okay, so. Now that we've got this uh, project here, we're going to go npm init minus y, which means this is going to accept all of the defaults. It's just nice and fast and easy. And we're going to go TSC, that's the TypeScript compiler, double minus init to initialize a TypeScript project. Just creates a, a scaffolding kind of TS config JSON file. Now I'm going to use Visual Studio Code for this. So I'm going to go code dot. It's going to open that directory in Visual Studio Code. Get rid of my other Visual Studio Code window from here. Nice. Okay, we're in. Now, the first thing that we want to do is we're going to go into the TS config file and make a couple of changes in here. We're going to change the target to ES2020. Um, and we're going to say outdoor is going to be dist. Dist. And then the root directory is going to be src. src like that. Um, no implicit any. I think we might turn no. Uh, I'll leave no implicit any on and see what happens. I like to roll a little bit creatively. So we're going to create the source and the dist directories now. So that's our source file and the dist file. Okay, next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to commander.io. We're going to create a new cluster in here. So this is commander cloud. Commander.io will take you to the cloud console where you can log in and you can also apply to get an account from here if you don't already have one. So I already have one, so I'm going to log in. Now I also have an, a, an existing cluster in my account, but I'm going to create a new one in here so that you can see how we do that. It's pretty straightforward. We come into the console. I can create a new cluster. So I'm going to do that. Free beta. I'm going to use the 0.23.3 and I'm going to call it the very imaginative name of my cluster development add. So once I click on that create, it takes a couple of seconds for it to show up and you can see it's got a red dot here and it says creating. So it's provisioning a ZB cluster in the Google Compute uh, Cloud. And uh, I think that we're using Europe West 1D, which is I think in Belgium. I'm on the other side of the world, right at the bottom, and I'm going over a VPN. Uh, to avoid the, the great Australian cyber attack that we're apparently experiencing at the moment. So some things might be a little bit slow, but if you're in Europe or perhaps in the US, you, you might find that it goes a lot quicker for you. But this provisioning stage here is going to take a couple of minutes either way. But we can actually move on to the next step here, even without having uh, the cluster created. And that is to create the client credentials for us, our program to be able to connect to the cluster. So if we come into the cluster details, I can click on clients here. I'm going to create a new client. Uh, and this client here, it's just a test client. So test client. Okay, I think I'm going to 
minus in there? Yeah, no spaces. Okay, so this has actually created some client credentials and I've got a client ID and I've got a client secret that I can click show to see. But probably more useful here, I have this entire client, ZB client lib uh, credentials. So we're going to come back to this to get those credentials when we're ready to make the connection to ZB. So while the cluster is provisioning, let's go back to the project and I'm going to open a terminal in the project so that I can install some packages in here. So we're going to use the ZB node package, which is the client library for node. So npm i ZB node. And another package I'm going to install is called .env. And .env is for deriving credentials from the environment. It's like a helper kind of library. So we're pulling those down. It's going to add them to my package.json file. It's going to create a node modules directory. And it's going to install ZB node and in along with their dependencies. So while that's coming down, we can actually um, get started in here. So we're going to create a new file in source, and we're going to call it app.ts. Now, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to import from the ZB node library, from ZB node. And what we import from ZB node is the ZB client. It's kind of the main, main class for ZB node. And then what we'll do is we'll create an async function, async function main. And in here, we're going to create a new ZB client. So const zbc equals new ZB client. It doesn't, we don't need to pass in any parameters to the constructor because if there are no parameters passed in, it'll scan the environment for, you know, the credentials for the connection. Okay, so now what we're going to call is we're going to say const res equals zbc, and we're going to query the topology of the Kumunda Cloud cluster like that. Um, but we need to await that because that's an asynchronous operation. It goes over the network. It's going to await the response. We get the response back, and then we're just going to log it out to the console. Console log res. Okay, now to get the credentials in here, we're going to create in the root of the project. So let me just move that app file into source. Okay, good. Now, in the root of the directory, we're going to create a .env file. And this is where we're going to put our environment variables. So we're going to grab them from here. There's a nice little copy button here that I can click that'll copy the credentials to my clipboard and go here, paste them in. We need to get rid of the word export. That's for a bash shell. And we're actually getting it from this configuration file. So Command D on the Mac allows you to do multiple selects. So I save that. And then I need to hydrate the environment from the .env file. And to do that, I can call require. And I require the .env library. And then I call the configure method of that library. Pretty sure that's the casing of that uh, command. OK, so let's go back here and have a look at the cluster, the overview. Uh, let's go back to the main overview screen. Okay, to see if it's provisioned and it's healthy. So you can see the, the light, the little icon's gone green. It says it's healthy. So that means the cluster is up and running. So here's where I can use TS node. So rather than having to transpile the code to JavaScript and then run it, TS node enables you to just do it with a single command. It'll transpile and then run the code for you. So here I just say TS node. And I say src slash app.ts. And let me make my Visual Studio code a bit bigger. There you go. It's nice and big now. OK, so if I run TS node source app, we should see a connection to the cluster take place. Nope. OK, require is not. So that might be a capital C in that case. Yep. Save that. If that doesn't work, um, OK, yeah, so we're going to do it like this. So we'll go const env equals. Um, it should be sufficient to give us IntelliSense on it. Let's have a look. If I now say env, env dot, nope. OK, so we'll just try importing from env. I'm not sure if .env has any typings that come with it 
from from dot env. Save that to get the no okay dot env dot no typings. Let's see if there's a typings file. Uh, npm i at types forward slash dot env. See if there's any type information in the typings repository for the dot env library. Yes, there is. Good. So we should now be able to get. Uh, huh. Let's try importing something first. Yeah, okay. It's called config. Config, not configure. So that was the problem there. So if I just call config like that, that will hydrate the cluster connection credentials from the .env file. So again, if we run ts node source app .ts, okay, classic error. I forgot to invoke my main function. There we go. Let's run that again. Transpiles the code. Authenticating client with command cloud, and there we go. Establish encrypted connection, and here is the topology of my broker cluster. I've got one broker in this array of brokers, cluster size one, one partition, one replication factor, support, node ID, and the host. Okay, so we've now created a Kamunda Cloud ZB cluster. We've taken, we've created a new connections client credentials, and then we've put those into our application, connected to the cluster, and then got the topology of the cluster. Okay, it's a good start. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to deploy a BPMN model to the cluster. So to do that, you're going to need the ZB modeler. So if we go and just Google the ZB modeler, it should return us a hit on the GitHub repo here. So it's in GitHub slash ZB-IO ZB-modeler. And under the releases tab here, I've got to sign in because I'm a committer to the project. So it wants to give me a view and access as a committer, but you won't need to sign in to get this. Sign in. Signing me in, redirecting. So it's going to take us to the releases tab here of the ZB modeler. And you can see there's a version for Linux, one for Mac, and one for Windows. A couple of Windows versions there for 32 and x 64 architectures. So pull the ZB modeler down. I've already got it installed on my machine. Let's see. ZB modeler. Very good. Okay. Um, hit that. Okay. Let's save that. We'll start with a blank slate. There you go. Tabula rasa. Get rid of the log. So we click on create a BPMN diagram. It opens a blank diagram. It's got a start event in here. We're going to add to that a task. And then we're going to add an end event. Now in this task here, if I click on it, left click, then I choose this little spanner slash wrench icon and I switch it to a service task. Okay, the name I'm going to give it is get time. Eventually we're going to get a time over an API, but we'll just get this started. And I create here under type, I put get minus time, get dash time, all lowercase. So this is my task type. And this is kind of the if you like the topic that my worker will subscribe to eventually. Uh, then I click on a blank slot space on the canvas and it gives me the, the properties for the diagram itself. It's got an ID, which we're going to call test process. Sorry, lowercase test dash process. Again, this is the programmatic label that we use to, uh, to refer to it. And we'll give it a human readable name, test process. Make it a little bit bigger for you. I can't make this details panel bigger, unfortunately. So I'm going to save that. And I'm going to save it into Kamunda, Kamunda Cloud Starter Node. I'm going to create a new directory in here called BPMN. BPMN. And I'm going to call this one test-process, like that. Save that. OK, now if I go back to my Visual Studio code, You'll see now I have the BPMN directory and I have the test process in there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to load that file from the file system and deploy it to the ZB node cluster. So to do that, we're going to import um, the path library, right? So we import star as 
path from path. Like that. Now, here we're going to go the const and then file name, I guess. File name equals path dot join. So you use this path library to do, do away with any kind of platform specific pathing, like, you know, POSIX systems, it's forward slash, Windows, it's backslash. So this gets you around that. If we do double minus, sorry, double underscore dir name, that's the current directory that the program is running from. And then we're going to go back up one level. And then we're going to go into the BPMN directory. And we're going to grab the file that's called test process.bpmn, like that. Gives us the file name. Now const response equals await. Now rather than ZB topology, we're going to do deploy workflow. And it says it's an error because it needs either a string or an array of strings or a buffer. <clears throat> so we're going to use the string, the file name. That'll automatically load it from the file system. And then it will deploy that model to the broker and log out the response that it gets. Okay, so if we go down here, we'll clear that terminal. Let's run the program now. So we go ts node source slash app.ts. We're going to see something similar where it's connecting to the cluster. It's authenticating the client. There we go, established encrypted connection, and it has deployed the workflow, and it returns the workflow deploy request. Now, the workflow deploy, the deploy workflow response, which is an array, of, you know, it's an object with workflows, an array of workflows, and this one has a BPMN process ID of test process. There's the, the resource name. It's got a unique key, uh, one version, and this key down here is like the key of the deployment event that just took place. Okay, great. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create an instance of that workflow on the broker. Okay, so to do that, we're going to, we're going to keep that deployment uh, event in there because if you redeploy the same process multiple times, it's idempotent. So uh, unless you've changed something in the model, it's just going to say, I've already got that, so you know, I'm not going to create a new version. So we can safely leave that in there. Um, we're no longer interested in the response anymore, so we'll take that out. And then instead, what we can do is we're going to go const response equals zbc dot create workflow instance. And we pass in the BPMN process ID, test process. And we also need to give it some initial variables, like an initial payload. It's a, a JavaScript object. We're just going to pass in nothing to start with. We're going to log out the response. So again, we'll run the program with TS node source app. It's transpiling it. Then it makes the connection. Then it's going to do the deployment. And then I forgot to await the result. OK, let's try that again. Let's await. Ta-da. OK, we'll run that another time so that we can see the actual uh, create workflow instance response that comes back from the broker. So here you go is the response. It's a JavaScript object again. I've got a unique workflow key for that particular instance of the workflow, the BPMN process ID of the, you know, the workflow definition that I used, the version of it, and here is the, this one's the workflow instance key. That's the unique ID of this instance. That's the unique ID of the workflow definition. <clears throat> now, we can go and inspect that process in the cloud, and we're going to actually see two. So if we go into the cluster details again, we'll see two because I, I created two, one after the other. So I click on here. Let's try refreshing that. Maybe it logged me out. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. waiting for console.cloud.comunda.io. I'm not sure where, where the console itself is running. It's an interesting question, actually. OK, click on my cluster. Now, in the cluster details view here, you'll notice at the bottom it says, view workflow instances in Comunda operate. 
So when I click on this, it takes me to the interface, the user interface for Operate, which is the visual inspection tool that comes with Commander Cloud. <clears throat> you can see here I have two running instances in total. So if I click on here, test process, two instances in one version, you can see I have two instances here. Here's an aggregate, aggregate view. So you can see both of them, the token has stopped at the first service task. So two of those active workflow instances are running. They're both waiting for some job worker to retrieve that job for the get time task. Now I can dive into either one of the instances from here and I can see here, this is one specific instance. It's got one token waiting at that point. No variables for it because I started it with no variables. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a ZB worker process to service this task here. So if we go back here, I'm going to create a new file in the source directory, which is going to be called worker.ts. Now I'm going to import the ZB node library here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, oh, first I need to create the ZB client instance, right? So const um, ZBC equals ZB client, no, new ZB client. Okay, now here I also need to get the configuration, right? No, because the, yeah, I should get the configuration as well, because I'm going to run this as an independent program. So we need to import this, and then we need to call config. We'll hydrate the environment. This will pick up the credentials from the environment, and then we're going to create a new worker instance. So create worker. And here we, first of all, specify what is the task type, so get time. And then this is the worker handler callback. And it takes two parameters, job and complete. Now job is a read-only keyed object. And complete is, it's a function actually. So in here what we'll do is we'll console log out the job so you can see the whole kind of metadata of the job that your workers will receive. And then the next thing that we do is we call complete with success. So you can see there are four methods, error, failure, forwarded, or success. So we're just going to call success to say succeeded. Okay. So if we now run that worker process, we will see two jobs appear because, you know, there are two workflow instances running. It's going to service both of them. So it transpiles, makes the connection to come onto cloud, and then it runs and it picks up those jobs. So you can see two of them here. And, you know, it has a key, the type, the workflow instance key, you know, the process ID, and version, the workflow key, an element ID, element instance key, custom headers, the name of the worker, number of retries for the job, the deadline, and the workflow payload variables. So this is all kind of metadata, and then you can think of the variables as the data of the, the workflow instance. Okay, so, so far we've connected to the, cl the, the cluster. We've deployed a workflow to the cl cluster. We've created a new instance of a workflow in the cluster, and we've created a worker to service the, um, to service the task in, in that workflow. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make a REST call from inside this worker. And to do that, we're going to install the got package. So I'll use pnpm this time, uh, pnpm install got. So got is a URL um, package, like a um, like fetch in the browser. It's doing its thing. Okay, so import got from got. Dun, dun, dun. Maybe using pmpm wasn't the best idea there. It's a bit slow. There and here, we're going to say const response equals got, and then we've got to supply it with a URL. So HTTP colon colon. Um, let me look it up. I've got an API that I'm running that you can use for testing, and what it does is it just returns a JSON object representing the current time in GMT at the time that you request it. 
So if we go down here uh, in the readme file, a REST service. Okay, so here's the URL here. Let's grab it from here. Drop it into here. That's the URL. And then we're going to transform it to JSON. And we need to await that whole thing because it's a promise, because it's asynchronous, it's going out over the network, right? <clears throat> we'll log out the response. Now, one thing that you'll notice here is that it's complaining about the await because I need to make the worker callback handler an async function to use await within it. Now, not only are we going to complete it with success, but we're going to pass back the time. So let's actually rename this here, rename the symbol to time to make it a bit more semantically obvious what it is that we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to split my terminal, and in one terminal, I'm going to start the worker. So I'm going to type in TS node source worker, that starts my worker. It's going to sit there waiting for jobs. In my other terminal here, I'm going to run my initial program, source app. This is the one that creates a workflow instance. So what we should expect to see here is that my worker services the task, and it's going to print out the time that it retrieves from the JSON API. And there you go. So that is the time from the JSON API. Now, if we go back to operate again, we go back to the front page here, you see there are zero running instances, right? But there are some completed instances. So let's go in here, and this will normally be unchecked. But you can click on finished instances in the filtering list, and you can see the completed instances. These early ones are the first two that, that we created and ran. This is the latest one. If I go into this one here, you can see here that the final variable payload of that workflow is the time object, which has been passed into the uh, 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 time is, yep, so it's got time, hour, minute been passed in into the payload. Okay, so what we want to do now is you'll notice that you know our program exited, it created the workflow, the workflow ran to completion, it had a result, but how do I get that result back from the engine? So what you can do to get that is instead of using create workflow instance, you can use create workflow instance with result. And what that does is it starts a workflow instance, but it waits until the workflow instance completes to uh, retrieve the final outcome of the workflow. Now, by default, this will wait for 15 seconds. Now, if your workflow takes longer than 15 seconds, you'll need to supply a timeout value, in which case you need to use a more complex um, function signature for it, and I'll show you that now so that you know what it is. So here, this is called, uh, let's just use IntelliSense to do it. BPMN process ID is test process. Um, 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 here we go. Uh, variables is, we're going to start it with nothing to begin with, and then finally, request timeout. Let's wait for up to 60 seconds. Actually, that's 60 seconds like that. Okay, so rather than logging out as it has here, the workflow, the create workflow instance response, this is going to actually log out the, the final outcome of the, of the entire workflow. So we've got our worker waiting for the task. Let's now run that application. It's going to create a workflow. So it's going to transpile, connect to the cloud, do the deployment, create a workflow instance. We're going to see the worker, and then we see the outcome in the, uh, you know, with the program. So here's the, the final outcome of the workflow. It's got the, the kind of like the workflow instance creation response uh, metadata, but it also has the variables. So here are the variables, uh, the final variable payload of the workflow. Pretty neat, huh? Okay, so the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to introduce conditional logic to our BPMN diagram. So if we go back to the modeler, what we're going to do here is we're going to drop a conditional gateway into the middle. So a conditional gateway needs to have conditions. And 
you know, if you're going to have a conditional gateway, you're going to have differential behavior. So we're going to have two differential behaviors, two pathways that it can take. If I click here and choose another task, now I click the wrench and I choose service task for each of these. And then I just link this one to the completion event as well. And that's the end of the process. Make it look kind of symmetrical. And let's give this a name, end, and this one here, start. Okay, so in here, um, the name, we're going to call this one good morning, like that. And then the type is make greeting. And then if I go here, this one's going to be good afternoon. Uh, okay, Let's turn the volume down on something there. Um, we'll ask someone to turn the volume down for me. So this one here again is make greeting. Okay, good afternoon, good morning. So we're using, we're going to do a couple of things here. We're going to do differential behavior based on custom headers, which is a great way that you can create these kind of patterns here. Let me show you how we, we uh, handle this flow and the logic. So if I click on one of these pathways, click on this one here, you can see that I have a name and I have a condition expression in here. And this uses the feel, which is the friendly enough expression language. So I have my condition expression in here. And this is for the morning time. So good morning, we'll take this path when the, um, let me drop this into a text file so you can see it, so it's big enough. So if I go in here, that's what it looks like. Equals time.hour is greater than zero, and time.hour is less than 12. So it's going to examine the time.hour, and it's going to see if it's after midnight and before midday, in which case, you know, broadly speaking, we say that's the morning. So it's going to take that pathway if it's in the morning. And then in all other cases, we want it to take the other pathway. So we can click on here and then we can right click. No, we click on here and let me make this a little different size. So it's not so cluttered and you can clearly see what I'm pointing to here. So we'll move the end event out to here, shift these along like this. Good. It's pushing that out, which is nice. Let's move this one down to here, merge these two together. Like that. There we go. Now if I click on this pathway, you see I've got a condition expression. On this pathway, I can put another condition expression, but really what you want to do is you want to have like a, it's kind of like a switch statement where you have like a default case, right? So you can click on this little um, wrench here and choose default flow. So if this expression evaluates the true, take this pathway. In all other cases, take the default pathway. And then what we do here is in order to get the differential behavior, we've got the same task type. So it's going to be the same worker servicing both these tasks. But to get differential behavior on it, we're going to go into the headers and we're going to create a custom header. And the custom header value that we're going to use is greeting. So greeting, and here we're going to say good morning. And on this one, we're going to create the same custom header. And we're going to say greeting, and we're going to say good afternoon, which is going to have to deal with evening and night and all that kind of stuff. But it is technically afternoon or after 12. OK, uh, let's make it a little more symmetrical just to uh, deal with my OCD, like that. <clears throat> Actually, really, to make it symmetrical, we would need to drop this to here, drop this one to here. I like the way that it's got those alignment lines there. And then pull this back like that. There we go. Oh, that looks great. It's like a little circuit diagram. Cool. So let's save that. Now, our program has the deployment task in it. And since we've updated the model, it's going to deploy a new version for us, which is pretty cool. So, you know, you can leave that deployment step in there. And as you update your models, you just to redeploy them, you just rerun your program. So we need to write a worker to deal with this good morning uh, and good afternoon tasks. So we're going to go to our workers file. 
and we're going to create a new worker in here. And this one is going to deal with create worker. This one's going to deal with the make greeting task. It's got the same callback handler signature, which is the job with the metadata and the complete function. And then in here, what we're going to do is we're going to pull the custom headers off. <clears throat> so I go back to my prepared earlier section here. I've got, um, okay, so we're going to pull it off the job.headers, job.custom headers. There you go. Very useful IntelliSense. Now here, I won't get any IntelliSense because it doesn't know what custom headers are on the tasks. You can actually strongly type these workers so that they do know about that using generics, but we're not going to do that. But we do know that it's called greeting, right? Because if we go back to our model and have a look at our custom headers for the tasks, we created a custom header with a key greeting, and there's the value. So we're going to grab that key off the custom headers. Um, we're going to do something else here. We're going to grab the variables. Um, so if I go to job.variables, same thing here, no IntelliSense at the moment because it has no idea what we're payload we're pushing in and you can strongly type it if you want to do that. But we're going to grab a name from the variable payload. So that means we will pass in a name when we create a workflow instance. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a greeting. So we'll say const um, greeting string, I guess, equals and what we'll do here is we'll use an ES6 templated string and we'll say greeting and space name like this. Yeah. Okay. And then what we'll do here is we will say, um, let's console log that out so that we can see it in the worker. Uh, greeting string. And then we're going to pass it back into the engine. So we're going to complete the job with success. And we're going to update, call say, greeting. In that case, let's just rename this to say. Um, rename symbol, and we'll call it say. And it goes into there like that. Good. There we go. That's all there is to that. We've, we've received a job. We grab the greeting, which is kind of like our behavior specialization attribute. Um, we grab the name out of the payload, the variables, and then we construct a greeting you know, t t time, good time of day name. We're going to log it out to the console and we're going to pass it back into the engine. So if we go back to our program, that means that when we create the workflow instance, we need to pass in a name. So I'm going to pass in my name, which is Josh Wolf. Like that. Save that. Okay, I'm going to restart my workers now. Ah. What I might do here is instead of logging out the whole thing, say variables, grab off just that key from the workflow like this. And then we'll say um, process completed. And then it's another ES6 templated string, really handy syntactic sugar. Start the workers. What could possibly go wrong? Let's find out. Okay, and then here, create a workflow instance. So transpile the code, make the connection to the Commander Cloud, create an instance of the workflow, which we then see the time, the greeting, and then we get back over here, process completed, good morning, Josh Wolf. It's actually the evening where I am, which means that it is the morning uh, GMT time, because I'm in the future. Um, you might notice over here that you've, you see a couple of um, kind of error messages that get logged out. And what can happen is, especially if, like me, you're in a different part of the world, you're over a VPN, sometimes the connection can fail, um, connection can be lost, but the library will automatically retry until it gets that connection and then completes the operation that you requested. So it's, it's quite resilient in that, in that fact, in that feature. So there you have it. We've created uh, a new cluster. We've got the client credentials. We put them into a file you know, so we can hydrate the, the constructor of our ZB client from the environment. We got the topology from the cluster. We created a workflow using the ZB modeler. We deployed that workflow to the cluster. 
We started an instance of the workflow. Uh, we inspected it and operate. Then we created a worker process to serve a task or to serve a job. And then we got a REST uh, request in the worker, added the result of the REST request, some data from there into the workflow um, variables. We then created our program to await the outcome of the process so that we can get the final outcome of, the, of, of that process instance. Uh, we then added a conditional gateway and you know, created different conditional branches based on the workflow payload. And then we created uh, you know, differential behavior using the same task worker, but using custom headers to create specialized behaviors, special behavior special specialization behavior specialization. So that's really a, a, a quick getting started guide to come on to cloud. There's a whole lot more that you can do with it, but this should be enough to get you started, get you feeling comfortable, get you exploring uh, through the documentation and other examples. Enjoy.